This is another practical course tutorial, specifically for the experimental determination on the half-life of Barium 137M. The video is intended as an experimental tutorial for students at the University of Cologne. And the experiment should only be carried out in a professional setting within a specialized nuclear laboratory. First a brief theoretical overview, then the experiment followed by evaluation and discussion and some additional information. To the theory, barium 137M is the decay product of cesium 137. Cesium 137 is one of the most well-known fission products. More information can be found in this video, but here are the key points. Cesium 137 is highly volatile and was released during events like Chernobyl. With a half-life of 30 years, it's in the sweet spot of being short-lived enough to have a extremely high specific activity, yet long-lived enough to be a problem for multiple generations of people. And third, Cesium 137 is produced in large quantities during nuclear fission. That's a rough overview on Cesium 137. It decays predominantly into Barium 137M. The M indicates that this is a version of the Barium 137 nucleus that is not in the ground state, but it's still relatively stable. The designation M is given to excited states that have half-lives greater than nanoseconds. Barium 137M has a half-life of 2.5 minutes. And that's the half-life we aim to determine today. It transitions to the ground state via the emission of the characteristic 661 kiloelectron volt gamma line. No other particles are emitted, just one gamma quantum. This is why I prefer to talk about gamma emission or an isomeric transition rather than calling it a gamma decay as many do. A brief chemical overview before we get to the experiment. When cesium decays, a alkali metal chloride turns into an alkaline earth metal, barium. Different elements have different chemistry. In this case, alkaline earths tend to precipitate as sulfides, whereas alkali metals do not. This chemical property is used in this experiment. Equipment needed. A syringe, a beaker, a Buchner funnel with a filter, a falcon tube for the stock solution, three Pasteur pipettes, a stopwatch, a metal frame with tape and a Geiger-Müller counter. Chemicals needed, barium chloride, cesium chloride, sulfuric acid, and of course, radioactive cesium-137 solution. First, prepare everything non-radioactive. Prepare a beaker with cesium chloride solution and one with barium chloride solution. The Buchner funnel should also be set up to prevent leakage. Apply a little grease on the edge of the funnel and then place the filter paper onto it. The ring should also be stored like this with the grease facing upwards. Now you can begin with the active part of the experiment. As a general rule of thumb, always try to do everything that doesn't involve radioactivity first and then at the last moment introduce radioactivity. I prepared a stock solution by adding a drop of concentrated solution to 10 milliliters of distilled water. A useful tip, since the syringe is definitely contaminated and the needle is so long that it can swing back and forth when you pull it out, to avoid potential contamination from radioactive solution splashing everywhere, make sure to use protection. Also, you can draw a little bit of air to prevent the solution from hanging at the tip of the needle. Also, use a cloth beneath the syringe to catch any spills. Label the syringe and store it for later use in future experiments. Now the assistant would add a small amount of the radioactive cesium solution to the non-radioactive cesium chloride solution in the beaker. The exact amount here is not crucial. The solution with addition of barium chloride, which I didn't film, is heated on a hot plate for 5 minutes. The goal here is to simply warm it up. Now onto the group coordination. Start timing as soon as the barium sulfate precipitates from the addition of sulfuric acid. The first measurement is taken after the suspension is filtered. Quickly rinse the beaker with distilled water and wash the filtrate again with more distilled water and then take measurements. What you are seeing right now is the first attempt. This measuring task is of course done by the person not working with radioactivity. The other person should clean up and check for contamination. At some point I realized I should show the stopwatch. The measurement starts at second zero and then stops at second 20. You have 10 seconds to record the value and then start the second measurement cycle from second 30 up to second 50. Then we have a 10 second break and voila, we have a full minute, which is quite easy to coordinate. Of course, it's not fully automated, but it's the most relaxed and time efficient way to do it manually. 
I did the experiment a second time and please, please, please do not immediately discard the filter cake once you're done. After about 25 minutes, any remaining barium 137M should be gone. Should be. After 25 minutes, take the filter cake and measure the background radiation in the same geometry. Do not use the standard background measurement. Your half-life results will be incorrect. So welcome to Excel. Here we have the data. Counts and background. In my case, the background was 17 counts per 20 seconds. Then the values are logarithmized using this formula. Insert everything into the table and display a linear equation and X will be your decay constant. Here's a prepared example from the second measurement run. Of course, some of you will use origin for those working with Excel. I just wanted to show you why using the logarithmic function is so important. Excel is notoriously bad at fitting exponential curves by default. When you display the linear equation, Excel only shows three decimal places. However, when you plot it logarithmically, the linear fit equation provides an additional decimal place. This number here is your decay constant lambda. Using the formula ln2 divided by lambda, you can calculate the half-life. I did this for both examples and compared the results to the literature. Can you see why this step is crucial? Discussion of potential errors. So why your half-life calculations might result in about three minutes or more. Some of this is due to the experimental procedure. For example, during precipitation, barium forms as a sulfate from the heat. We also do this on the Geiger-Müller day with sulfur 35, but in that case, this excuse doesn't apply here. There we also precipitate barium sulfate, but the sulfur is radioactive, whereas in this experiment, the barium is radioactive. Why do we do this? Well, with the sulfur 35, we realized that if the solution isn't heated, you get a much finer precipitate. So fine that it sometimes passes right through the filter paper. This is why heating is used to create clumps of barium sulfate. This is great for filtration, but bad for separating out the cesium-137, because the otherwise water-soluble cesium can get trapped in these clumps and end up in the filtrate, screwing with your measurement. You can observe this in the background measurements. Even after 25 minutes, you still detect barium 137M because the trapped cesium continues to produce it. You can minimize this by washing it, but ultimately you need to correct for it mathematically by subtracting the residual production as a part of the so-called background in this case. This is why it's so important to measure the filter cake after 25 minutes instead of just using the standard background. Additional information for those who are curious. First, an important note. Strictly speaking, the 661 kilo electron volt line we measure with the Geiger Müller counter does not come from season 137, but it comes from the barium 137M. Gamma rays always come from the excited state of the daughter nucleus. What's special here is that the excited state is so long lived that it can be isolated in the lab. Something that's quite rare to be honest. Still, the 661 kilo electron volt line is often called the cesium line because this is how it's commonly referred to. And this barium 137M can only be produced through the cesium 137 decay. Now onto a bit of a deep dive into the cesium 137 decay. Why does barium 137M form at all? Why doesn't it directly go into the ground state? To explain this, we need to understand the following. During beta minus decay, two fermions are produced the electron and the electron antineutrino. Both have half integer spins, as it's typical for fermions. Atomic nuclei also have a spin. Cesium-137 has a spin of 7 halves plus, while barium-137g has a spin of 3 halves plus. This gives us a spin difference of 4 halves without parity change, plus or minus. This spin difference is too large to be carried away by these fermions. During beta decay, only transitions to states with maximum spin difference of two halves are possible. For cesium 137, this means the daughter nuclei must have a spin of either nine halves plus, seven halves plus, or five halves plus. Does the barium 137M state have one of these spins? No, it has a spin of 11 halves minus. So it's also four halves away from cesium, but with a parity change from plus to minus. This inaccessibility of the state explains why cesium 137 has such a long half-life. The transition is described by quantum mechanics and if something is Forbidden, it's still possible but just takes much longer. A spin change from four halves 
without parity change is second forbidden and with a parity change it's first forbidden. This is why the formation of Baron 137 m is favored over the ground state. There was a lot of quantum mechanical blah, but as I said, it was only for those who are particularly interested in this topic. A special thanks goes to the Working Group of Analytics and Fundamental Nuclear Chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the Division of Nuclear Chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye.